Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Back to the podcast, brothers. This is Rick Moore, past master and current secretary of Fort Worth 148. This is Billy Hamilton, current junior warden of Fort Worth 148. And today we have a special guest. And I am Stephen Berryman. I am junior warden at Hillcrest Lodge 1318. Glad to have you, sir. Well, we're Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, absolutely. We're down a man. Gabe, was he in transit at the moment as we speak? I think so. I think he's uh, traveling back from Oklahoma City for the weekend, and he's got to go right back. Ah, well, that's not too bad of a drive. No. Nah. Got to keep the home fires burning. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So, like Billy said, we're we're doing a fraternal spotlight this week with our special guest, Stephen Berryman from Hillcrest Lodge. Uh, and as always, before we get into subject matter, we're just going to go over some discussion questions. I've only got one. Uh, I went to a presentation that Rumsey, uh, right worshipful Jim Rumsey did at, uh, look at me. I'm, I'm about to go over when to use titles and I've already used the wrong one. <laughs> That's greatness. Uh, right. Worshipful Jim Rumsey. Yeah. So in a public setting, it's brother Rumsey. Right. Uh, but he gave a great presentation on etiquette, you know, and he uh, apparently has a tiled version. So if you want to hear it, get in contact with him. But it was fantastic on when to do certain things and when not to protocol. And one that really caught my attention was the ritualistic titles, right? Worshipful, most worshipful, all that stuff. And I wasn't aware, but you don't use those in a public setting. So here you are in a Masonic Lodge at the dinner table. You walk up to the Grand Master and he's sitting next to his wife or someone else's wife or somebody who's not a Mason. You're not supposed to call him most worshipful. It's supposed to be like at this point, it, I, I don't even feel right saying it. Brother Stogner. Right. You'd say really? brother and their last name. Anytime yeah, it, in a public setting. It, it feels weird, doesn't it? Because it's it's like ingrained. Like, oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that seems wrong. I uh, talk to talk to Brother Rumsey. <laughs> I, I, <will. laughs> I know you can take it up with him quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it's all about public uh, being in or out of the public. So when you're around the Grand Master, no matter where it is, and nobody's within earshot, most worship is fine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's always been that way or if that's kind of a newer thing because those titles can really throw some ears back. You know, like, what'd you just say? Most worshipful? Right. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> like you worship that guy? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then, you know, also on top of that, when you finally figure out who's right worshipful, who's most worshipful or worshipful, you can't wait to use it correctly. And, you know, you're out there in public and it still should be brother and their last name, mm -hmm. which is something that I didn't know as well, you know, because I'm, I'm very informal. And a lot of times I'll brother Billy, how are you doing? Right. But it should be brother Hamilton, especially in public, you know, to show them the respect that they de deserve and vice versa. The fraternity deserves all that good stuff. Well, and it's interesting because a lot of these points of protocol, we just never know, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, we make assumptions or we hear it incorrectly from someone else. You know, we, we get bad tribal knowledge about it. Uh, yes. But lately, I have been finding that, uh, like, uh, you know, Brother Chance Chapman had presented a presentation on protocol in Dimole, and I was just blown away because it's like, you know, it was like proper order of like introductions and, and stuff yeah. like that. It, it's stuff I never would have considered before. 
Uh, it, just today, I was looking at one for protocol for Knights Templar from Grand Encampment all the way down. It, it even lists, you know, like if you have a banquet where everybody should sit. I mean, that's how how formal the protocol gets. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, it, which Jim went over that is what most comprehensive list of introductions I've ever seen, you know, from Masonic to appendant bodies, what order they go. In. It's crazy. So much right. to learn. Yeah. And there's a proper order if, if people are talking as to who's mm -hmm. first. Yeah. <laughs> who speaks last. Who speaks first and who's introduced last. Yeah. So just before we move on, I want to just list off the titles for everybody. So, every, you know, most people know Grandmaster's Most Worshipful. And then Right Worshipfuls are Deputy Grandmaster down to the Grand Marshal. So Senior Warden, Jun Grand Junior Warden, Treasurer, Secretary, Grand Chaplain, Grand Order, Grand Marshal, all Right Worshipful. Grand Senior Deacon down to Stewards, Deacons, Persuivant. Musician, photographer, and Tyler are worshipful brothers. And then, of course, past grandmasters, committee on work, and DDGMs are right worshipful as well. So, is there an easy way to distinguish who's right worshipful and worshipful? Is there like an invisible line just west of the east uh, of the lodge? No, it's really. I don't know, you know, because I've, I've looked at the list several times because the marshal's not doesn't outrank the senior deacon, I didn't think, but right. maybe I'm misinformed, but he is right worshipful. That seems off. The, yeah. yeah, at least a few of those seem a little out. You would you would think that the uh, deacons or stewards would outrank some of the you know the chaplain marshal type positions yeah because yeah. the what way i understood it is when you line up the chairs and in installation ceremony in a blue lodge they're lined up in order of rank right so if you're looking back towards the west out of the east you know worshipful masters on the right all the way down to the tyler and if i remember right the marshal is even past the stewards yeah it is it's one of the last ones installed I also know, though, that the marshal is the Grand Master's right-hand man. Right. I mean, True. When, when you're appointed Grand Marshal, you know you're fixing to be saddled up on. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> anytime you get to meet a Grand Marshal, you, you thank that man and give him a hug because he's working his <laughs> tail off. <laughs> right. And it's all behind the scenes, so you don't even see it. It's crazy. Yeah. So wow. maybe that's why he gets that title. He's Maybe road hard. <laughs> yeah, I see. I, I mean, I had even thought at one point maybe it was all elected officers, but no, you're you're right, right? Chaplain, yep. order, marshal, those are all appointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be interesting to find that in the proceedings to see what that was all about. Right. So let's get let's get cracking on the personal questions here, and then we'll get into the uh, the main subject while we had you on. Um, mm -hmm. So when did you join and how old were you? Seems like it was about six and a half years ago. I was 36 years ago, or I was 36 years old. 36 years old. <laughs> nice. So you've been in six and a half years? Yeah, that seems, seems about right. So what inspired you to join? My grandfather was a Freemason. My uncle was a Freemason. I watched them. They were two of the most inspirational people in my lives. Um, both very, very good, godly people. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they were well-spoken, soft-spoken, nice. And I didn't see that much in my life. It was like most people were just abrupt, angry, um, flippant, whatever. And these two people were good. My My grandfather died when I was 18. He was... I, I found out at a later time he was uh, Scottish Rite Shrine, and he he was everything was based in Houston. 
My uncle was uh, a member of the same lodge as my grandfather. Um, he's actually about to celebrate his 50 years at Freemasonry in 2020. So um, kind of happy about that. But, um, you know, my dad never followed that path, but my uncle and my grandfather did. So I saw them as guiding lights in my life, and that's what I wanted to follow. So that's what that's I did. It. It's, yeah. it's not uncommon to hear grandpa was a mason <laughs> mm-hmm. you know I, the most things we we hear on here and i'd have to say billy is either that or a funeral right. one of the two is what inspire most people to join so powerful mm-hmm. so uh which lodge did you join and why i initially joined uh lebanon 837 in frisco And I have since moved my membership over to Hillcrest 1318 in Dallas. And I am the current sitting junior warden. Have you, did you start from Steward or? Uh, At which which lodge? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I got you. So you kind of went through a few chairs, the first lodge and then picked up where you left off here. Yeah, at Lebanon, I ended up being the uh, junior steward, senior steward. Then I jumped to senior deacon, then junior warden. And then at Hillcrest, I have been junior warden. That's all that I've done so far. Gotcha. You got your work cut out for you there. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So, is and, yeah, we're going to touch on that, too, because I have a real affinity for that lodge. Oh, um, awesome. Um. So what do you see as the biggest strengths and weaknesses of the fraternity, Texas specifically? Strengths. Um, Strengths, we have a whole lot of members that are very varied in uh, personality, uh, experience, whatnot. Uh, Weaknesses, we are not very quick to accept change. We are not very quick to accept differences that might, you know, kind of buck us the wrong way. Yeah, I got you. So you don't have any examples you want to share, do you? Um, not so much on that topic. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I try to play nice, and, and, and so, sometimes it doesn't come naturally to me. On this one, yeah, this one comes naturally. I, I don't want to play on that one. <laughs> no, I get it, and I think everybody kind of feels that out there because we all have that one issue that we're like, what in the heck are we thinking here? Yeah. So – what do you th- how do you think we improve on that how do we improve on the weaknesses we we yeah. need to embrace change we need to embrace people that are different than us and embrace different methodologies try to incorporate people into our lodges that can bring different aspects different um methodologies to our functioning as a business because really and truly our lodges need to function as businesses. Open, close, it's all relatively business speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we can bring that all around and, and make it um, where we have the strongest people to help us along the way, not necessarily in officer positions, but help us in you know, um, different um committees and what have you yeah that would, that would be an asset to our fraternity more than anything else if yeah. we could get the, if we could get them involved in grand committees uh to actually turn the fraternity around bring membership in whatever it, it, yeah. it would be helpful we have people that are really strong in those aspects no and i'll follow what you say because when you start throwing the c word around in masonry i mean it usually will shut the conversation off instantly with a lot of guys that, you know, when they say change, they start thinking you're talking about some of the landmarks or something crazy like that. But Mm -hmm. the feeling I'm getting from you is something I feel similar that we need to accept change in the way society has changed and how we communicate, how we do business. Uh, Cause you know, the lodge is run like a business. It's just like a business. It should be. It, 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 and, and it, 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 the part that needs to be is, but it's ran like one in 1950. 
and mm-hmm. we have to accept change in how things are done. I mean, because take, for instance, any of this, stuff, the petition, you know, uh, sure, we might need a signature and birth certificate on something, but why are you filling out the petition that automatically uploads into the database? Mm-hmm. You know, there's so many things that we could be doing uh, from small PDF. Yeah. Simple. And, and money saving and a lot of things we can embrace. So, you know, when we say, when you hear change from guys, you know, our age and younger, <clears throat> We're not talking about changing something crazy like the ritual. No. You you know, if you know me, I am not one that is shy about bucking the system. Mm -hmm. That is kind of what I'm known for is actually bucking the system. Yeah. But when it comes down to the nuts and bolts, I want it to stay the same as much as we possibly can. But fix the things that are broken. Yeah, I I think you have hit the, that's where the disconnect is. Because when we say change as the younger generation and the older generation, they shut off immediately. And it's like, no, 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 all the things you love, we love. But there's ways we can do this other part better. Agreed. Much more efficiently. Right. It's it's not like we're trying to, you know, set fire to the temple. It's like, wait, there's... (laughs) There's new tools we have available that, that could maybe remove some of the headache. Yeah, it's like we've got a diamond bit DeWalt here to sharpen our tools. Why don't we use it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of the steam engine. we got a combustible here. Uh-huh. So what's your favorite aspect of masonry and why? I like the camaraderie. I like the esoterica. I like the history. Um, actually, my lodge is getting ready to do a uh, trip off to Washington, D.C., where, where we are going to visit a lodge to see the uh, Master Mason's degree on site in D.C. with the Grand Master present. We are also going to see the Washington Memorial. We are going to go to the uh, House of the Temple to visit with the Art Bill Hose and uh, Brett Morris and visit with those gentlemen and let them fill us full of whatever knowledge they possibly can. Just, yeah. you Basically. know, make it what we can. You know, we're only there for a, a couple of short nights. We've got to make it the best that we can. So fill us full of as much knowledge as we can and then send us on our way masonry by osmosis exactly (laughs) you know i have to say every time we ask that question because we try to ask the same questions to each guest and i I, because i want the listeners to kind of gauge in between what they see in common and what they don't and something that really stuck out to me is it doesn't matter how esoteric they are how what a history buff they are it usually always starts off with the camaraderie or fraternalism yes and it's so funny that you see so little of that in lodges. Oh, yeah, we do fraternal stuff. We do a charity drive or we do, uh, you know, we do this. Uh, we do floor school all the time. It's like, no, no, no. I'm talking about when do you sit in the backyard? Nothing on the table but discussion. Yeah. When do you go out for lunch with your brothers? You know, when do you really get to know these guys? Right. That is that is something that I can happily say that we do every night after any of our events. So if we have a uh, educational night, if we have our stated meeting, if we have a degree night, we go in afterwards so that we mm-hmm. can have uh, socialization afterwards. We can have uh, discussions about what we just covered in the meeting. If we can have discussions about the degree we just put on. Whatever it is, there is something that can be discussed. We can learn, we can grow, we can move on. Yeah. And uh, to me, I think that's step one for any lodge. Even before you start floor schooling or worrying about who's going to be what officer, you need to be hanging out. Yeah. Because there's going to be tough times at lodge. And if you're not on that, if you don't take your brotherly love to the next level and get to know this guy, What's he worry about? What's he happy about? What makes him tick? He's not going to be there for you when the thing, when the tough gets going. 
And I'm not saying that as a slight, but it's so easy to go, man, I don't have time for that drama. I've got kids at home. I've got to focus on this. But if I go, man, I've been out with beers with Steve so many times. I know that he needs me there. Just through conversations, they're there. Yeah. They get they get more value out of it. So I think that's step one. I agree. Get, get your fire pit. Do what you do. Call your brothers <laughs> over. Have a good time. Fire pit and barbecue. Yep. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Texas, we don't do much without firing up a grill somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> So, Billy, I'm going to take this first question, and then we'll let you hashtag go ahead, Billy. All right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, these are pre-subject questions, because I couldn't talk with the junior warden of Hillcrest without bringing up a few things about it. So, before we dive into the main content, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Hillcrest, um, because it, it's it's got such an inspirational story. And one of the things that really stand out to me is the way you guys merged Mm -hmm. love field. Were you around when that happened? That was uh, before I showed up. Yeah. Gotcha. How long ago? Cause you, what have you been there? I've been there for a year and a half. Got you. Cause it wasn't that long ago. They merged. Was it? It was probably about three years ago. Gotcha. And I mean, cause That's something that I think needs to be documented pretty well because it's not common. No, it's not. And and it it was for the good of both lodges. Hillcrest had uh, given up their building. They were uh, renting from other lodges. I believe that it was uh, Luffield that they were renting from for the most part. Um, They needed a place to stay. They Luffield was having issues with membership. So at that point, it became a good merger. It was like, hey, this was meant to be. So we're having issues with membership. Y'all have a need for a business or for a uh, a building. This is a proper proper merger. Yeah. So it, it just made sense, and they they merged funds, they merged their membership, and they merged all of the. Um, the the functional people that were actually making lo- the lodge work as a whole so um it, it, it just worked out you, you've got the people from love field that are still very very involved in hillcrest they're they're making it work they're uh, like our treasurer right now is a love field past master he's an absolute godsend and uh, we couldn't be happier with that. And we've got yeah. other uh, love field gentlemen that have stepped up to the plate and they've helped us out. And it's, it's been wonderful. See, and I mean, you say that nonchalantly, like it made sense in the numbers uh, because most mergers do when a launch is struggling, if there's someplace yeah. close, it's going to make sense. The problem you run into is the nostalgia. You know, that's where my grandpa was raised. And, what ultimately happens is that charter goes back to Grand Lodge and all those assets and all that history goes down to Grand Lodge in a closet instead you, of a lodge right down the road from you. You know, last year at the lodge leadership training in Waco, um, we were asked to ask questions of the Grand Master. I asked a multi question question of him where it was basically what are you going to do to promote the consolidation of underperforming lodges what are you going to do to make it easier for lodges that are having difficulties merge with others so that we don't just have lodges demising but rather consolidating into other lodges so that their funds aren't lost so that their history isn't lost and, and that was big for me. And uh, right worshipful Chapman looked at me and goes, was that just one question or was that multiple questions? And I was like, there's a <laughs> compound question, but it, it goes along with the same, same breath. And it, 
it was it that's the way that I think it needs to happen. It needs to be we we need to have a methodology for resolving these lodges that are not in a good place financially or are yeah. not in a good place membership wise where they can consolidate where they can make themselves stronger where they can um feed off of each other and make themselves into a bigger stronger mass that is actually useful for society instead of just holding on to the history that was you know, well, my granddaddy was this member of this lodge. Well, you know, great, fantastic. What's that lodge doing now? Yeah. Make There's it so better. many that are gone. Right. Yeah. I mean, just drive into any small Texas town, go downtown to the courthouse, you know, in the middle of the town. And I, I'm sure you can walk around for five minutes before you find the original lodge. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Too yeah, much and, to be gained. Yeah. So yeah, the the number of, of lodges that are lost simply because they they didn't explore that option. It's it's immense. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Uh, so actually, Stephen, one of the the most impressive aspects about Hillcrest is the building that it's in, right? <laughs> I mean, the remodel. Yeah has made it into I mean it is one of the the most beautiful lodge rooms I would say that that I've seen in the entire state of Texas uh, how did such a big investment because I'm sure it costs a lot of money how did you get that do you know the process how did it get approved by the members the process that I understand occurred was that Hillcrest had the funds that they wanted to spend on the remodel and that was uh, provided to the uh, uh, to the certain committee yeah the building committee the building committee was allowed to assign to different contractors for the individual pieces of work so um, yeah they they had the money that came from their investments slash other uh portions of funds and yeah and all, all of that went to the reinvestment into the building itself so it, it makes a lot of sense i mean because if you're going to merge with another lodge you're mm -hmm. going to have to bring something to the table it, yeah and then that's what i understood came to the table I, I like i said i was not there for it yeah but th that was what i understood came to it was um hillcrest said that they would pay for renovations to the building and renovations yeah. to the building included the library the uh, dining hall and to the main lodge room itself yeah, and, and we're not talking about just like, oh, yeah, we slapped some paint on and put some linoleum down. No, 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 no. When you walk in this place, first of all, when you drive in it, and it reminded me of driving in the Bat Cave or something. Well, it's down yeah. in the quarry. When, when right. you think about it, it is truly the quarries of yes. Love Field. <laughs> right? so it, it is where all of the rock for Love Field came from. So it is truly a mason's quarry yeah that's, that's the cool aspect of it it's totally cool and man then when you walk inside because the outside of the building's not bad no so when you, it, you it, walk it, in you, 70s it, it yeah. has that look uh but the inside man oh my god it's to me it's what a masonic lodge should look like yeah the dark <laughs> mahogany wood you know secret passageways you you've got to give props to Kyle Walquist for setting that up properly. It he was property management that is done appropriately. It it yeah. it, 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 it looks very masonic. No doubt. I mean, from the oh, yeah. paintings y'all had redone, stained glass. I mean, it's just it was. You could tell some love went into that thing, and what a better building you know a way to build relationships and around a project like that yeah yeah uh, even though I, I i do have to say the only complaint i have is uh 
when you drive by it. I actually drove by it <laughs> before I realized, oh, I think the lodge is there. You know? <laughs> it's subterranean. Yeah. Because it's right. like ha- house, 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 nothing, house, house, and down in that nothing is the lodge. Oh, no, <laughs> exactly. it, it's like it's like house, 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 unmarked gate, house, house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, There is a Masonic sign. It is not lit, but there is a Masonic sign there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, it's, it's very discreet, too. Right? <laughs> very discreet. <laughs> Yeah, you keep the riff out. out. Yeah. I, That's it. Oh yeah, it, it, it almost kept me out. <laughs> <laughs> That's greatness. All right, so let's jump into subject question. Uh, uh, so you've got a pretty cool side gig. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So I got into woodworking probably three years ago. I was sitting in the South for a degree. And I had always been told to gavel with authority. So gaveling with authority, I had a fancy gavel that had a uh, square encompasses with a G inset in the head. Mm-hmm. I smashed the head. It completely <laughs> disintegrated in front of me. And I, I it, this is during a degree. And I, I kind of looked down at it and I'm like, oh, no, what do I do with this? I've got pieces in front of me. So I I looked at it. I finished the degree. I got chastised for destroying a gavel. And (laughs) at at that point, I went to my father-in-law's house and he taught me how to turn. So I was turning wood from that point forward. He taught me how to turn um, my first couple of gavels, which were not pretty. They were just useful hammers. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't have the best finish on them. They were not the most ornate, but they were functional. Yeah. So from that point forward, I, I started to strive to make myself better at turning. I, um, I, I think it was about two years and four months ago, I bought my very first lathe. I ended up teaching myself to turn, um, Mm -hmm making it better, turning different things, bowls, pins, bottle stoppers, corkscrews, whatever came my direction that people wanted, I was turning it just to yeah. see, what I, see what I could do, teach myself to do different things, push myself, make myself learn something different. Yeah. So I, I, I was doing that constantly. And it, it just kept growing and my, my finishing techniques became better. I was working with better materials. I was working with uh, better wood that was more exotic. It was just, everything kept getting bigger and better and everything kept becoming more expensive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's always more expensive. It's like, Oh, well you want to do this. It's going to cost you five times as much as what you were doing before. Great. Thank yeah. So I started making setting malls whenever, you know, my friends were going through their um, being installed as master. I made a, a triple set of uh, spalted uh, maple burl malls for the lodge that I was previously at. They, they were absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And they gorgeous. It, they, they were absolutely beautiful. I used one when I was sitting in the South and it it was fun, but I never really got into Masonic work. I, I just, I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to take advantage of the brothers with any of that. Yeah. then, Then I kept seeing stuff coming out from manufacturing plants that had our symbols emblazoned on them either being stamped on them or just uh, kind of haphazardly thrown on them to sell to brothers. And that bothered me. Yeah. So at that point I started contemplating, Hey, how, how can I do this and step up the game and, and make it better? My finishes have become better. I'm learning different techniques, whatever. So the very first Masonic item 
like truly Masonic, not just a gavel or a mall or whatever, but something that had our symbols on it was a pen. And I ended up making one that had the uh, George Washington apron on it, the one that was uh, created by the Marcadia Lafayette's wife. And um, so I took an image of that, I printed it on my printer, I cast it in uh, resin and then threw it on some pens. And I was like, okay, let's see how this goes. And that sold really, really quickly. So I started coming up with a couple of other different ideas, um, other images that could be printed out and those went. And from there, I started to decide that I didn't necessarily want to just be printing images out on the printer, but I wanted something a little more personal, something a little more pretty and yeah. subdued. So um, I did a little bit of the steampunk work where you uh, fold metal around the blank and then distress it and add whatever to it. And I had a couple of coins that were uh, solid sterling silver, but they had the square and compasses emblazoned on them. They had the 999 pure silver. So I had those on the silver coin ingot and I uh, attached that to the steampunk blanks and cast that in resin. And that was cool. And they were pretty, mm -hmm. but still wanted something a little different. So I've got a buddy that has been helping me. He has the ability to print on, um, print on metal. So it basically embosses the metal images into the metal uh, form. So he has been taking images that I've been sending him. So like square encompasses with a skull or all seeing eye or something along those lines. And he's been embossing that into the metal and then turning it into a steampunk blank. And then I've been able to uh, cast that in resin and then turn it into a pen. So right. it, wow. it's basically a different evolution, becoming a little bit more high tech. And then with my finishes coming a whole lot farther, uh, becoming a whole lot more like glass. It's just a whole lot prettier these days. You kind of went over some of the material you use from resin to wood and I guess a little bit of metal in there. Is there anything else that you have thrown in the mix? Of course. I have used a, uh, so our brother Justin Bauer had shoulder cancer a while back. He yeah. reached out to me and he asked me, if I would be able to work with that material. The moment that I found out that it would, it would not turn my shop into a hazmat situation, <laughs> <laughs> which was a major concern of my wife, yeah. I, I ended up um, reaching out to my doctor, finding out that the process they use for treating the bones that are pulled out in that situation um, does render them not radioactive and not cancerous so everything is all good mm. so he showed up and gave me a sliver of bone i gave it to one of my buddies who was a taxidermist who removed all the connective tissue and all the nastiness and from that point forward i was able to embed that in two blanks one for him one for me and um we both have a pen that includes his shoulder bone so since he no longer has his shoulder, he has a prosthetic in there. He, he has his shoulder in a pen. So that's one. Wicked. It's a very, very dark item and kind of pretty cool. I, I, oh, yeah. Really I, cool. I, 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 I really wanted to not like it as much as I do, but it is truly cool. And it is actually in my hands right now because it, it is just too cool um beyond that uh, i have worked with the wood from the house that goonies was filmed at i have some wood <laughs> on, <laughs> yeah yeah you know they they did a remodel a couple of years ago where they pulled off lots of the paneling from the house they pulled off lots of the uh decking from the deck that goes around the house and they mm -hmm. they sold it off and it was a really, really poor quality uh, cypress or uh, pine type wood. So 
really, really porous, really, really lightweight. It had lost most of its integrity. So I had to stabilize it uh, in a resin type material. And then uh, once I turned it, it's absolutely stunning. But um, I, I've made a couple of pens that included a cap that has the Goonies Never Die type thing in a steampunk type setting, um, along with the Goonies wood for the body. Um, above and beyond that, I have worked with uh, woolly mammoth ivory, which is 80,000 to 100,000 years old usually. Um, you can tell the difference in mammoth ivory versus elephant ivory being that mammoth ivory has about a 90 degree striation in the uh, grain pattern versus a, a elephant ivory, which is about 135 or greater. So um, that's how you can tell the difference in the, the grain of that type of ivory so you know what is legal versus illegal. So um, yeah. actually, I did have a question about the mammoth ivory. Sure. How rare is it? Because I know there's like uh, a, another company here in the Dallas Metroplex, uh, Artisan Dice, has dice sets that they make out of mammoth ivory. So I was thinking that was like super rare. It, it's uh, pretty it's pretty darn rare most of what we're getting here in america is coming from russia or canada okay um, there there is some that is being pulled out of the ground in waco really close but oh, wow. um I, I i don't believe they're selling it so everything that i've gotten has come from russia via canada and um if if you're looking to buy it is probably about two hundred dollars for less than a half square foot i ended up reading an interesting article about the harvesting of uh woolly mammoth ivory that i was absolutely fascinated by but it's you know obviously primarily coming from siberia like you mentioned exactly. uh, and these these guys come out there and they have to wait until the frost thaws mm -hmm. and so they're constantly surrounded by deep wet mud there's constant risk of flash floods uh and they're digging these pits just deep pits and they pull out these woolly mammoth bones that are literally just all over the place in siberia because they have this, <laughs> they had this huge population and so these guys are in this wildly dangerous environment they're because the frost thawed enough but they might flash freeze overnight, so they're still at risk for hypothermia, uh, mm -hmm. frostbite. They're at constant risk for drowning in the mud. Uh, guys regularly die on these expeditions. It was absolutely wild. Um, but it is like the wild west of materials collecting out there. Uh, and agreed. They and make, they make and bank, so. In addition to that, you have the ivory, which is easily turnable. It turns like any other um, bone that we're dealing with these days. So like lots of the other stuff I deal with is alligator jawbone or shark vertebrae. So it turns similar to that. The moment that you get into a mammoth tooth, that's a rock that has petrified. It is, it is like turning a rock where you need to use carbide or diamond tools or just sand, <laughs> till it, sand it till it's round um it, it's a completely different animal so wow. yeah I, I i don't play with the stuff that's harder than this because turning mammoth ivory is turning at a whole lot harder level than most of the woods that i turn or the rest. yeah because if i'm if i'm turning a hybrid of uh, ivory and resin every time I hit a resin spot my tool dips in because it's it's going really really hard and then it hits that resin and it's soft and it oh, yeah. so it, it's a constant battle the entire time I'm I'm creating that piece I, I, I never thought about that yeah because I mean it's like two completely different types of density yeah, oh, yeah. the entire time <clears throat> And, and really and truly, anytime you're doing a hybrid of any type, you have to worry about that. So like the the pin that I made of Justin's shoulder, it has resin, it has the bone, and then it has a Honduran rosewood burl. The rosewood burl is pretty dense. The resin, not so much. And then his bone, 
it was uh, very chippy, very soft. Um, yeah, there wasn't much holding it together. So yeah, um, it, it, there are a whole lot of densities going along the line that you have to worry about when you're when you're actually turning it. So it, it, it's it's just a, a different thing that you have to think about whenever you're actually working with the materials. So let's say you set that up and you got his, you got Justin's bone in there. How, mm -hmm. how much, uh, do you have to figure out that, you know, those little tricks and stuff before I only you had, start? I only had two blanks. And I, so when I talk about a blank, I'm talking about a seven eighths by seven eighths by five and a quarter piece of material. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that is one blank. And I made two. Um, the very first one was his, I set that one aside for him. And I was like, okay, there's, there's no question that one's going to be his, it's going to be, you know, whatever. So I turned it, it was successful. I sent him pictures. <laughs> I was happy. And then I said, okay, now it's time for me to play with mine. <laughs> so I, I got to relax a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, because it, it, with something that small, it doesn't seem like you'd have a lot of play. Like, as soon as that tool touches it, you're getting into the finished product. You are. Yeah. And, and with, with, with his, I didn't get it quite to the entire seven-eighths on both pieces. So I was worried that I would have any showing on either piece. That was the one concern. Yeah. Mm. I knew that there would be some in each one of them, but I couldn't guarantee that it would actually be visible. Well, that's interesting. That was some tedious work. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, here we go. You you would never think that in pin making, but yeah, yeah. Well, but the unfortunately the end product was amazing looking. I was I've been fortunate enough to see the the pen in person, so uh, it was really stunning. You know, Thank you. So I appreciate that. Phenomenal work. Although I do have to say that if there is an item that Draco Malfoy would be buying in, uh, what is it? Not Diagon Alley, the other one. Uh, oh. He would be buying something at a dark wizard's shop that had a curse on it. That pen might be one of them. You, you, <laughs> you, you say that, but at the same very moment you say that, I actually have on my shelf right now a blank made from the Christchurch uh, cathedral in the uh, Slytherin colors. So Christchurch is where the Great Hall of Harry Potter was filmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have That's wood. Awesome. From, I have wood from the floor of that cathedral, and then I poured the colors of the resin: the uh, green, the black, the silver for Slytherin, because that's my house. <laughs> oh, it's my a house. fellow Slytherin, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and you don't have to answer this, but where do you find this wood? Goonies where, wood, Harry Potter's and, wood. Goonies wood was found on eBay. I heard that they had the wood up for sale, so I ended up searching it out and finding it. The uh, the Christchurch uh, Harry Potter wood. One of my buddies over in Anna had a whole stockpile of it and uh it's been for sale forever in a day and it has certificates of authenticity but um he had a couple of chunks that were available to be put into uh casting resin instead of just pure blanks most of the time you have a blank that is just a seven eighths by seven eighths by five and a quarter mm -hmm. by itself not able to be cast with resin but his were a little bitty shorts had rough edges on it so we cast it in resin gotcha so i because I, I was wondering i knew you wouldn't google something like famous wood or something <laughs> hey you might not come up with a response you're looking not for. really there's all kinds of historic wood from different important buildings from different important military installations or ships that's not typically what i do yeah but it's all available. I could get it if I really needed to, but it's not my thing. Yeah. Oh. That's what I like about it. Yeah, you do your thing, man. 
I, I try to bring high class, high quality to a, a material that we are not used to seeing. Yeah. Where are we at, Billy? I'm lost now. Uh, the going from zero to woodturner. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> So, so I, I I brought up a little bit of it when I smashed the gavel head. So right. <laughs> that that took me from smashing gavel head to creating gavels. That was the beginning of it. My father in law taught me how to turn. I mm. turning gavels to replace those. I, I moved forward. I did other gavels for the lodge. Um, and then he also turned, uh, taught me how to turn some pins. He always dealt with just the very low line, the slim line, the this, the that, the stuff that he could get from a catalog that he knew the people from. Yeah. I ended up delving into online forums. Online forums led me to better materials, led me to better companies, higher quality materials. And then that's where I am today. Gotcha. So step one is find a mentor, huh? <laughs> Basically, yeah. He yeah. he had done a lot of a lot of woodwork whenever he was growing up. He did wood shop. That wasn't something that I ever did. I was in band. I was in tech theater, but I I never did the wood shop part. So yeah. uh, he did that. He enjoyed that. He enjoyed the welding. He's taught me everything so any shop in his or any tool in his shop has been open game for me and that's been something that i've absolutely respected and loved yeah that i can use anything and i can learn anything and he can teach me and he and his brother who was a professional welder can teach me to use the tools appropriately not screw things up and not hurt myself right, as much yeah. as i normally do so on on that note, last year when I was turning gavels, I ended up breaking a forefinger and a thumb. So um, <laughs> it, 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 some, sometimes things do go amok. And Brad Billings, I, I am calling you out right now. I broke a thumb on one of your gavels. Ah, uh, so, um, figures. <laughs> yeah. If, of course, so, it'd be Brad. If you don't mind me asking, what led to breaking the thumb and the forefinger? I, I was working on the handle for one of his gavels, and it came out of my chuck at about 4,000 RPM. And when it oh did God. that, it, it, it caught my thumb as it was flying out. And I grabbed it, rechucked it, finished turning it as I'm watching my thumb and my wrist swell. Jeez. But it, I was like, I've got to get it done. I've got timelines. I have stuff I've got to do. It has to be done. <laughs> wow. Talk about suffering for your craft. craft. Yeah. Sacrifices we make. Right. Yeah. It's my for word. <laughs> well, I love Brad. That, that's the way it goes. Yeah. So what do you recommend? I mean, if, if somebody's looking into it, because I've, I don't, turn much anymore at all uh that as much as i used to but i got i got bequeathed one and man as you're talking about something you can get lost in now uh, yeah. it's very very cool uh art what do you recommend as far as if someone wanted to get into this i mean it depends on what the price point you want to get in at it you know, you, you've you got multiple different pieces of equipment that you can get into. I, I currently am on a Recon um, 1218, so I can turn a 12-inch bowl that's 18 inches long. Um, my previous lathe was a Jet 1014i, so it wasn't even a uh, variable speed. So anytime I needed to change speeds, I had to move the belts over, and that was a pain. Yeah. The current one that I have is variable speed. I keep it on the highest belt possible. So um, I, I, I really and truly most of the time turn at the absolute highest speed that it goes, which is close to 4,000 RPM. Uh, when I'm doing my finishing, I turn it down to the very lowest speed, which is about 1,300. 
So not really and truly slow, but it does what I need it to do. Um, tool wise, um, I started with a set of carbide tools. I used the easy wood tools. I didn't like the size of them. I didn't like the price of the replacement cutters. I didn't like any of that. So I moved to the axe. The axe was about $120 for just the tool itself. The cutters were about, uh, I think, $30 each. I ended up finding a replacement where I could buy a 10 pack of them or whatever for a couple hundred bucks. <clears throat> didn't like that. So I bought a set of tools that ended up being, I think, about $600. And that is all my carbide tools. It's the round, the square, the W, the diamond shaped one, the cutoff tool, all of it all at once. <clears throat> and it's an absolutely huge MIDI tool. It's a uh, great big monstrous stainless steel shaft. Um, the, the handle on it is huge and it makes it where me with my big hands, I don't have to even think about it. It's just right there. The tool goes under underneath my um, armpit. So if I get a catch, it's not gonna it's not gonna throw me off. It's just gonna rip out the any bad material that I'm working on and move on. Um, gotcha. That tool itself was about six or seven hundred dollars and i just recently ordered replacement bits for it that were about 150 dollars that were diamond tipped goodness so it's not the cheapest hobby it, it, <laughs> it, it is not the cheapest hobby in the world it, it does what i need it to do and it it makes me happy it makes it where yeah. i make cool fun stuff for y'all you know, like I, I, I am currently working on a gavel for my senior ward who, who will be installed Worshipful Master in July. I mm -hmm. pulled a block off my shelf. It was an ugly piece of oak. He had told me he doesn't want anything flashy. He just wants a piece of wood. And I was like, okay, what do you want? Oak, hickory, pecan, whatever. And he said, just regular wood not my my hybrids you know because yeah i do i do hybrids i mix resin with wood mm -hmm. so i the moment he said i just want regular i pulled a piece of block off my one of my shelves that said oak i put it between centers i started turning the moment it was round i looked at it and i was like that's not a piece of oak that's not just regular oak started turning it more and more, looked at the grain pattern, started to do the finish on it. It is a spaghetti oak burl, which is one of the most obscure, most rare, most prized pieces of oak turning possible. And that is going to be his cattle head. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you wanted plain. This is still not plain, but it is as plain as I can get. Yeah, I hope you legit. I, I think that's the one I saw the picture of that you posted, and that grain was gorgeous. It, it was probably three or four days ago. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. And and that's what I do. That's I I don't deal with plain. I don't deal with boring. Yeah, because I I want my brethren to have something that excites them in their life. I want something that makes them think that masonry is you know wonderful remind them of how good it is yeah and see that that's the thing that gets me about the whole you know because you see some people saddle up on guys that are doing this in the fraternity um and like you mentioned earlier your only other option is to order it from pakistan from somebody that just puts them out by the dozen i i wasn't going to call it a country but China and Taiwan are pretty bad about that. And, yeah. And those are the ones that I fight. I, I see them stamp the square encompasses on a clip on a pin. 
and I see them stamp it on a blank. And I'm, I'm like, brothers will buy that because it has our square and compass on it. Not because right. it means anything, not because it's important, because they were able to buy it. And yeah. I don't want that. I, I truly know that I am not the most cheap person out there. You can buy it cheaper elsewhere. Yeah. You get what you pay for. You You don't get what you pay for. And see, and call me woo woo if you will, but I think there's something to the, you know, the, the charge that a pen has that one of your brothers made, you know, especially if they know, if you know them, they know you, uh, there's, it's, you pay a little extra for that. <laughs> there, it's going to be that much more special. Rick, my you're pens, no woo-woo. <laughs> I am woo-woo. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> my pins are probably in the hands of seven to eight grandmasters that are sitting right now. Mm-hmm. And it's growing every day. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, Stephen, uh, do you have any plan on expanding this? you know, this business into a a full-time venture? Not a full-time venture. I am, uh, I I do have a DBA. I, I did file my taxes last year because of this business Mm. and I suspect it will continue on for the next couple of years the same way. Gotcha. Full-time. So so as of right now, no plan. My wife has said, no, I cannot go full-time on this, and I cannot go full-time on my barbecue. (laughs) Sad day. Shut down by the highest authority in the house. I keep having brethren and family try to get me to open a barbecue, and my wife says no. That's a lot of work. This adventure, Steve. (laughs) Yeah, we know we need some barbecue. (laughs) <laughs> it is good. I, I will say unbiasedly, it is good. <laughs> well, it looks good. I so is there any project that you have plans or that you desire to get into? I mean, because you've worked with such a variety of things. I mean, I'm working on next? a couple of projects for uh, for both the Sam Houston um, or what what is it? The Brad's project, the uh, Hall of Fame, Sam Houston Hall of Fame, a Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I I am working on Sam Houston Hall of Fame. Um, I have a couple of projects working for them. Uh, one of them is a specific pen project. Another one, Brad and I are working on one that is in conjunction with the Grand Lodge of New York. So um, that one will be fun as well. Cool. Yeah. So brother Oscar Allen, he he and I uh will be in conjunction with Brad on on this one project. Okay. Sweet. Very cool. So you guys got any other questions before we wrap her on up? I guess that's a no. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here for the party. <laughs> uh, well sweet. Come on, Gabe, ask something fun. <laughs> I don't have any of my notes with me. I'm jumping in last minute. <laughs> uh, he got permission at last what's minute. A project, what's a project that you got into that you went through and then when you finished it, you went, you know what? This wasn't worth my time or, you know what? I'm never doing that again. Um, there have been a couple of bone projects that I have not liked. Um any time that I've dealt with deer antler, I have absolutely hated it. It has made my shop smell wretched for probably three or four weeks at a time. My oh wife my has my wife has told me never again on the deer <laughs> antler. So there's that. Um, other projects. There have been a couple of times where people have said that they want something that they have promised that they would pay um, and then not follow through. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really do stuff ahead of time anymore. Yeah. 
Yep. So if, if they aren't Very willing, to, reasonable. if they if they are not paying me ahead of time, I'm not working. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, blame that's... you when it's for fun. You know, my, mostly as a hobby, you don't want to go in the hole. Right. You know, I you know you say a hobby. I I do this as a side business. Yeah. So it, it's not even a hobby anymore. I, I right. <laughs> it's grown. At this point, it's like, do I write this off as a tax tax issue, or do I just kind of whine about it and cry and let it go away? Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I, I I definitely know where you're coming from. It it's frustrating, especially because you're doing these to order, right? It's every and, bit of it. Because yeah, that, I I don't like doing mass produced anything. So when I did all the mass produced stuff for Grand Lodge this last year for uh the Grand Lodge concert, I, mm -hmm. I was told I was told that people would show up, they would buy, people were telling me that they were gonna show up and uh make purchases um i made i believe close to 50 pens oh my I, gosh i sold seven <laughs> yeah jesus <laughs> so at, at that point with me working in the custom work i was like oh this kind of hurt <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it didn't make me have the warm smiley fuzzy feeling and I didn't know what to think from that point forward. Yeah. Right. No, I don't blame you for doing them one at a time now. And, yeah. and well, that's, that's what I did up until that point. But the, the moment that everybody was like, oh, you've got to do this for this event. I did. And it just didn't work out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's, you know, that's why you get a good catalog going. It's where you give people ideas of what you can do and then they can create because that's what's cool what i love about it is you can just say hey man this is kind of what i'm looking for i'd like to have this included you make it happen i mean exactly because if you if you think about it one of the pins that's sitting in front of me right now is one that i had made from my leg tattoo so ronnie zulu did a tattoo on me that was the uh all of the uh ninth class of symbols Okay. So in our master's degree, we have ninth, ninth class symbols. And he did those on a tattoo that's on my calf. And I have one of those as a pen. It is the only one in existence. Mm -hmm. um, really cool. Yeah. But I could replicate it if need be. That's good stuff, man. What's a piece so, of equipment that you would like to expand to in addition to your wave? So I already have a table saw, band saw, um, chop saw, drills, all that good stuff. Probably the only thing that I could think of that I would really like to get into would be laser. Mm. Mm, Billy's got lasers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, yeah. That's, uh, that's actually been my pet project over the past couple of months lasers so with a with a jig would be fantastic yeah yeah that would be would be great but that's kind of why i laughed when you said you know people who order stuff and then don't pay for it because i've been in the exact same position <laughs> in, in the first three months that i was in business so true business not just you know selling stuff um i had a friend from a long time ago and he <laughs> burned me for a lot of money and that was that was the very first one and i was like okay i'm done with that I, i'm not gonna play that game anymore <laughs> right well all right boys y'all ready yeah. yeah let's wrap this thing up wait what do we got next fraternal quote right quote of the yep. week quote of the oh, week and i did switch this to a fraternal quote Gabe. I didn't I didn't know if your original one was or not. And I was like, that's too long anyway. It's a teddy <laughs> quote. Oh, Lord, <laughs> you're, so, you're gonna harsh on my norm norm the vibes. Yeah. The Yankee workshop norm. <laughs> oh. Yeah. No, hurt I my soul. The... Hurting my soul. 
<laughs> I went with a no, short go, quote by go uh, for it. Brother Teddy, and it is far and away the best prize life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Mm. I think t- Tommy Chapman, that was one of his favorites, but it, uh, it's been one of mine as well. And that just kind of the lathe work kind of reminded me that because, man, it's one of those things you can just get lost in. Next thing you know, it's been five hours. Yeah. Yeah. Been having good. fun. Yeah. All, All right. right. We'll go with closing thoughts for me. I, I can't harp it enough. Get in where you fit in in masonry. Find your niche, you know, because I, I've let the old cliche go. You you get out of it what you put into it. You know, that that that's a BS cliche. Um, but there is a lot to that in the sense that, you know, you got to hook up with a mentor, but find your niche and where you can contribute, you know, uh, and develop it. Make it into an art, whatever it is. It, you never know. It might be ended up turning stuff on a lathe, virtual work, whatever. You know, but find your niche. Right. Yeah. And and for myself, I, I could say, you know, as much as so my career is uh, in IT, uh, but there's nothing that beats working with your hands. Um, so I, I definitely commend you with with the work you're doing. I mean, they're beautiful pieces. But I find that that when doing work like that, I, I don't know if this is the same for you, uh, but, you know, it's almost like meditation. It is. I, I work in IT as well. So, yeah, I, I'm an IT project manager. I deal with bringing requirements from the customer to the client, uh, to the uh, development, the <laughs> entire process of the development life cycle um but is that like from office space it it is (laughs) i i I have people skills Um, (laughs) at the same time at the same time i use turning to uh, uh, basically as a therapy for my hands i have essential tremors It, it makes it where uh, at times my hands are absolutely useless. I will shove them under my thighs to make it where they stop shaking or oh, wow. so that people don't see them shaking. Right. Um, it looks almost like Parkinson's, but it is not Parkinson's. It is yeah. thick. My mom had it. She has had uh, electrodes implanted into her brain to stop the shaking. And um, it doesn't do so well, even with the electrodes for her. Um, she still shakes. She still does everything, but she can drink soup now without spilling the soup all over her uh, chest and what have you. So I use it as therapy. I, I use it to calm my hands. You know, in the past, it's been, well, you know, my doctor has told me, use whiskey, use... Um, <laughs> whatever else to try to calm it. Yeah. Whiskey calms it to a certain extent, but it does not make it where I can think about something else and just make it kind of go away. When I'm turning, when I have that tool in my hand, when I'm grinding against the wood, my hands are not shaking. Mm -hmm. So it is therapy. So just like Gabe said just now, it is therapy, it's therapeutic, it is, it is heaven for those of us that actually do it and make something from it. Yeah. So Gabe, you've got like 20 seconds. <laughs> I'm late to the party. Steve, thanks for coming on. Um, thanks, brother. Having seen, all, having seen all of your work, it's just really cool to get an insight. I'm going to be looking forward to listening to the first half of the podcast uh, once it comes out and uh, I'm on my way home <laughs> from Oklahoma. Um, Safe so, travels, brother. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, and did we get your closing thoughts? Uh, I guess that's the, the therapy counts. Yeah. It, uh, also, it, what's the best way to reach out with to you, Stephen, on Facebook? 
but either contact me via phone 214-236-6565 or my uh, email is berryman b-e-r-r-y-m-a-n 37 at gmail.com or my Facebook is uh, Yeti's Gorgeous Grains dot com. There you go. Very cool. And those photos are gorgeous. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, All right, brothers, we got to sign off real quick. Make sure you get your tickets from Masonicon. This is Rip Moore signing off. This is uh, Billy Hamilton signing off. Gabe Yager signing off. Stephen Berryman signing off. <laughs>